Paulson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm proud to say that I stand here today, like the rest of my party room, as the last speaker to say that I won't be voting for these bills. What we're voting on today is one of the bravest, most significant and most necessary structural reforms this country has seen in decades. And we are taking a leadership role on the rest of the world doing suit, following suit if we're going to reduce global emissions. And it's times like this that I, I can't help reflecting on the fact that uh, six years ago I was sitting in front of a computer at the University of Tasmania after I was asked to put together a course in environmental finance. At that stage, no other university had looked at doing a specific course in environmental finance and how we could use financial markets to help uh, mitigate environmental damage. And it's quite ironic that I'm standing here in the Senate today, having seen all the simple things that took me 12 months to pull together, to teach to students on how we can counteract an, a problem such as global warming with all the best policy advice available. Uh, is being thrown out the door by a government that is supposed to understand markets and understand business. So let me start at the beginning. Carbon dioxide, like other greenhouse gases, is pollution. Now, that might be the very first line that you type on your first slide that you're going to teach to students. And if you don't believe that, if you don't get past that first line, then there's no point in progressing with the rest of the course. Carbon dioxide is a pollution. Now, interesting hearing Senator Eccleston yesterday talk about historical incidences of carbon dioxide pollution leading to periods of global warming. We're well aware of that from climate records. But that doesn't abrogate the importance of carbon dioxide in today's age. It actually supports the argument that CO2 is a greenhouse gas that can lead to runaway climate change and all the negative impacts we see on our ecosystems and on our future economy. You also accept that if it's pollution, it's what economists call an externality. That is, something that's being produced by a company that's having a negative impact is not being in reflected in the cost of production of that good. Now we know also from well-established theory that markets fail. Markets don't always price things well. They do price some things well, but they don't price things well like pollution. So there is a role for government, an important role for government, to step in and fill the externality gap by levering things such as taxes or excises on pollution. Now we've heard a lot in the last two days about the CEO of Virgin talking about the impact of the carbon tax, apart from the fact that he and Qantas signed up, lobbied to be included in the, carbon, the price on carbon scheme. We haven't heard anything about the excise that has long been levied on aviation fuel or other fuels in this country. What we hear about is the so-called carbon tax and the damage that's done to the profits of a company like Virgin. Interesting also to see Qantas very clearly in estimates last week, clearly saying that carbon tax wasn't the issue, whereas we've seen the Prime Minister and our Liberal cohorts in the last two days running with this line, this populist line that somehow the carbon tax has destroyed Qantas. We'll get back to that in a minute. This price signal, this price on carbon, that's accepted theory to price pollution, is designed to transition industries away from pollution to cleaner forms of production. It doesn't just have to be electricity. There's a lot of other things that we leverage market-based instruments on. That is why we call them market-based instruments. And we are transitioning in this country, and certainly in my state of Tasmania, which is 86 per cent renewable energy generated, away from dirty energy to clean energy. And along the way, we've created tens and thousands of new jobs, investment and innovation in this country, which I haven't heard mentioned once in all the debate from anyone on the other side of the chamber. 
Yes, a scheme like this will have its costs and it may have design flaws that need to be changed. It will also have risks. It's our job in government to manage those costs and to manage those risks. So getting back to the first line that I'm typing for my students, if you don't accept that CO2 is pollution, then I can say to you, and I did say that to some students, you don't have to have proof to be prudent in finance. That's what the insurance industry is based on. I don't know if I'm going to get killed and run over by a car, but I have life insurance anyway. Because if I do, it will be catastrophic to my family. I insure my house in case someone breaks in, or my car in case of an accident. It's called managing risk, and it is the insurance industry that has driven action on climate change since the 1980s, because they are the only industry pricing the risk of climate change, not just to households and individuals, but to businesses and to industries. So taking strong action on climate change, and I emphasise action that is effective, is an insurance policy in itself. That's what climate action is, and it's an easy way to say to people, even if they don't necessarily believe in CO2 being pollution that leads to global warming, where do the balance of risks lie? Would you put your money on it if you had to make a bet based on the available evidence? Isn't it prudent to manage our risks? Yes, it is. We need strong action on climate change because it is an insurance policy, as Senator Cameron so eloquently pointed out, on the future of our grandchildren. But it's a lot more than that. It's also important for our economy. So, the crisis we face today, and I stress it is a crisis, couldn't have been more clearly highlighted than by CSIRO this morning, putting out their definitive report on observed changes in the long-term trends in Australia's climate. I'll read you the future climate scenarios for Australia. Australian temperatures are predicted to continue to increase with more hot days and fewer cool days. Interestingly, their conclusion was also the same as the bomb when Senator Ruskin asked the question during estimates. Seven of the ten warmest years on record in Australia have occurred since 1998. When we compare the past 15 years to the period 1951 to 1980, we find that the frequency of very warm months has increased fivefold and frequency of very cool months has decreased by a third. A further increase in the number of extreme fire weather days is expected in southern and eastern Australia, with a longer fire season in these regions. Average rainfall in southern Australia is projected to decrease, with a likely increase in droughts, frequency and severity. The frequency and intensity of extreme daily rainfall is projected to increase, Tropical cyclones are predicted to decrease in number but increase in intensity. Projected sea level rise will increase the frequency of extreme sea level events. When I read that, that's talking about the future, my future and the future of my kids. And when I read that, that spells costs. Costs of living in this country under climate change. Not the cost of my bloody electricity bills this month or next month. The cost of living with. This is the CSIRO here talking about the potential catastrophe under a future of climate change if we don't take action. We've just given billions of dollars to farmers for drought, and no doubt they need it. How many more billions of dollars will come? How many more billions of dollars are we going to have to spend on mitigation strategies for bushfire risk, for rising sea levels? Interesting, I've never heard the costs of climate change mentioned from the other side of the chamber in this debate. But there it is. That's what we have to do something about, folks. Clear as daylight. So, why are we standing here today debating whether these bills should be scrapped? There's three good reasons that I can identify. The first is the zombie spin that we've seen from the Abbott government leading up to the last election. Once again, Senator Cameron very eloquently pointed out the impact that this has had on the debate. Short-sighted, offensive, cynical, political opportunism 
of Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister. The example of Qantas this week, I can't think of a better example. Qantas is in trouble, workers' jobs are at risk, and it's the carbon tax again. The second thing I can identify is ideology, pure and simple. I was reading the IPA website last night, looking at their freedom index, and I've got no doubt that that is now, that is now a layer that we have to deal with with this new government. How will new regulation or new policy impact the freedom index? And sometimes I can't help thinking that the ideology has bred pure spite in trying to cancel some of these bills, especially the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. But lastly, it's about special interests. It's about the big end of town. It's about being puppets on a string, having the IPA, the Business Council of Australia, all the other large vested interests in this country dictating your policy. Now, let's consider the carbon tax bills specifically. The Australian cheer squad is very clear. The Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council of Australia and the Mineral Council. Industry calls for swift repeal of carbon tax. I wonder why. I wonder why. Considering that only 0.1 per cent of Australian businesses are liable to pay the carbon price and that four companies alone pay nearly 50 per cent of Australia's carbon liability, concentrated in a very small number of industries. This demonstrates how the big polluters, which Al Gore recently in Australia so clearly articulated on the 7.30 report, have hijacked our democracy. They are driving the government's agenda and, sadly, potentially our national legislation. And I would like to quote from uh, an article which I really enjoyed by Ross Gittins in the Sydney Morning Herald. We are now a nation of rent seekers. He says, Professor Garner has long argued that Australia is unlikely to see another era of extensive microeconomic reform because of the growth in rent seeking behaviour since the days of the Hawke Keating government. What gets me is how blatantly self seeking our lobby groups have become. It is as if the era of economic rationalism, with its belief that the economy is driven by self interest, has sanctioned selfishness and a refusal to cooperate for the common good. He then goes on to say, it's finally dawning on people that major and genuine reform, which the carbon pricing scheme is, requires a degree of bipartisanship at the political level and a spirit of give and take on the part of powerful interest groups. But these prerequisites have never been further away than now. Instead, what we get is lowest common denominator politics from the politicians and rent-seeking posing as reform from the interest groups. And then he goes on to mention all the various business lobbies that have a significant interest in investing in having this legislation changed. Now, I used to teach the special interest model and special interest effects to students, and it's probably a bit difficult to talk about in the next, uh, the next six minutes, but it, we all understand that lobby groups play a role in democracy. They get in the ears, ears of decision makers. But they also make the decisions that we make as decision makers very clear. They make the benefits and the costs to us very clear. They can donate to political parties. They can threaten to advertise against you in aggressive advertising campaigns. No clearer example than we saw with Labor changing its view on the mining tax when that occurred. I've also seen it with Coca-Cola and the Beverage Council aggressively advertising against a national uh, recycling scheme like a, a bottle bill. So we face these trade-offs. Do we take on special interests and risk getting a backlash from voters? Unfortunately, for most voters in this country, they don't have the time or the energy to invest in fully understanding legislation and how important that is. That is our job as government to do that. And that is why special interests win, because they can very powerfully concentrate the benefits and costs to decision makers. And decision makers know that the general public have lots of things on their mind when they go to the ballot box. And that's why it is a con to say that this government has a mandate just on the carbon tax, or on the mining tax, or on turning back the boats, or everything I've heard in this chamber. You suddenly have a mandate on it. How many Australians go to the polling booth 
understanding those policies, voting specifically on those. It is my view, Mr Ackerty, Deputy President, that people voted for a change at the last election. I don't doubt that. But that was because of the circus that we saw from the Labor Party. And I have a very clear view on this. The rash, we call it the rational Order. ignorance of voters. Order. So there are a multitude of factors that go into decision making when we get to the election. And unfortunately, once again, it's why special interests get away with dictating government policy. But what about the positive interests that support renewable energy? The Australian Clean Tech Review in 2013 estimated at least 53,000 Australians are currently working in the clean tech sector, with strong growth since 2009. Modelling by several organisations, including Austrade, believes that current renewable energy targets in combination with other elements of the clean energy package, including a price on carbon, will deliver $20 billion of investment in renewable energy by 2020. And Tasmania, my state, nearly 100 per cent renewable, receives a $100 million dividend from the price on carbon that I once again have yet to see any politician, especially those from Tasmania, say how my state will be compensated. $100 million a year. That's 12.5 per cent of non-Canberra revenues to the state government from a price on carbon because we export clean energy. How are we going to be compensated for that? Solar PV, 18,500 jobs, $8 billion in private investment, a growth sector, with traditional industries around this country failing, with the car sector, with farmers needing more handouts, with the collapse and troubles experienced by commodity industries, SPC, how are we going to invest in the new jobs of the future? Where are we going to get this innovation from? At least Senator Conroy is here and has done something for this country with NBN. <laughs> how are we going to build the industries of the future? Because I can tell you, we have one here now and it's called clean energy. And they talk about sovereign risk. I've never seen a worse example of sovereign risk than what the Liberal Party has done to the clean energy sector in the last four years. Nothing business hates more than uncertainty. Uncertainty. Businesses factor in costs. Businesses are forward looking, as you well know, Senator Back. And all you have done Order, is Senator pull, Back. The, pull the carpet out from underneath one of the future growth drivers for this country. And how are you going to replace it? Price on carbon is a signal to transition this country to a clean energy future. And we are the only party that has shown leadership on this. And let's talk a little bit about leadership. Lord Devon, head of the UK Committee on Climate Change and Tory politician, has slammed the Abbott government's push to pull back climate change policies. It lets down the whole British tradition that a country should have become so selfish about this issue that it's prepared to spoil the efforts of others and to foil what very much less rich countries are doing. All that pollution which Australia is pushing into the atmosphere is, of course, changing my climate. It's a real insult to the sovereignty of other countries. It's wholly contrary to the science. It's wholly contradictory to the interests of Australia. And I hope that many people in Australia will see when the rest of the world is going in the right direction what nonsense it is for them to be going backwards. Tory politician. Tory politician. Now, Senator Macdonald's not in here, but I challenged him in the House the other day when he said, I have yet to have anyone from that side of the chamber say to me why us cutting our small contribution to global warming is making a difference. It is making a difference because this country has shown leadership and has shown conviction. And it has come at a very small sacrifice. Considering what previous generations of this country have had to sacrifice for us, us accepting a one or two dollar fare on an airfare from a carbon price or a small increase in my electricity, electricity bills oh, is hardly a sacrifice to take a long-term structural reform, long-term structural reform to do the right thing for my children and for future generations of this country, not to mention for the animals that live in our ecosystem, in our ocean, and the ecosystem services that support life on this planet. This is the biggest structural reform this country has seen in decades. And I and the rest of my party will not stand by idly while you try and pull the carpet out 
from under the feet of my children and future generations of Australians.